Let's go now to Charles Zeewee, who is right uh, a lot closer to the shuttle than we are. We only got a passing glimpse. Our best view was, unfortunately, on television. Charles, how was it from your vantage point? Boy, I tell you, Miles and Walter, uh, I've seen a number of shuttle launches, and it's always impressive to see the boosters light up and the thing jump off the uh, off the pad. You feel it beating on your chest as it's going out. But looking down at the end of the runway as the shuttle was landing, and you just see it drop out of the sky all of a sudden like it's on some giant roller coaster, unpowered roller coaster. That's really impressive. And uh, right now, uh, you know, it's just something that uh, you can't forget. You can't forget the launches and you certainly don't forget the landings, although they're not as fiery and as spectacular. They're every bit as memorable. Right now here at the landing site, the Waterford High School Band from Columbus, Ohio has struck up. They happen to be at Disney World over in Orlando, asked if they could come over here and welcome Senator Glenn home. It's not his hometown high school, but they're from his home state, and he served as U.S. Senator. Right now, out on the runway, on runway uh, 33, uh, the uh, recovery vehicles are moving into place, the sniffer trucks. Discovery and this crew took us around and around, and that view is still tremendous. And seriously, to those whose prayers, along with my own, followed us around the world, our heartfelt thanks and appreciation, and to all the NASA team from top to bottom and bottom to top, bottom to top, that continue to do the superb research job that benefits every home in this nation. And, it's, and often without notice or proper recognition, our thanks and my personal thanks for a job well done. Give each other a pat on the back. You deserve it. Payload Specialist number two, John Glenn, 77 years old, clearly euphoric, uh, Bob Cabana, obviously pleased with uh, the performance, and we're talking about the emotions right now. It's got to be at once exhausting and yet, as you say, very uplifting. Oh, it's truly exhilarating, Miles. Uh, it's just you can't imagine how fulfilling it is to have uh, accomplished what they've accomplished. The question now, medically, is going to be how John uh, reacts to return to gravity after nine days up there, that his age is part of the experiment, as a matter of fact, uh, how an, an, an elderly individual responds. There's some thought okay. that we can talk about the monitoring the and what they're doing right now. The blood, uh, after the gravity, almost gravityless uh, situation in space, to normal gravity on Earth, he, he may be a little uh, uncomfortable and disoriented, even for a period of days. Oh, it, it's uh, Walter. Uh, I'll never forget my first space flight, and you learn. You adapt quicker to one G coming home and you adapt quicker to zero-g every time you fly. But my first space flight, uh, this is no small task for, for anyone, let alone uh, a 77-year-old. Uh, when I went to get out of my seat, I felt like I was, my legs were lead weights. I could hardly move them, you know, and I had to get up and do a few deep knee bends and get going again before uh, I actually felt like I had legs under me. So you really feel heavy when you come home after being in space for that amount of time. Right. There's always a bit of a, a struggle, I guess, is the term, between the, uh, the crew people and the scientists, who probably, if they had their way, would like to have everybody carted off in a gurney so they could be analyzed properly. Nevertheless, if you're a commander, if you're a pilot, if you're a member of the crew, you like to go out and take a walk around. Oh, definitely. You want to get out and see your spaceship. You want to walk around and, uh, <laughs> and see how it looks and uh, just uh, you want to keep that, uh, that feeling going for a little bit longer. In the early days, you wanted to look around and see how many of the tiles came off of the... Uh, <laughs> The uh, uh, tiles that were there to protect against that extreme 3,000 degrees of heat of coming back into the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, at, for the in the early days, that was a serious concern. We weren't at all sure that that tile system was going to work. You bet. But uh, we've got a good handle on that now, and it's uh, become an extremely reliable system for protecting us from that reentry heat. As I understand, wasn't there one tile up by one of the OMS thrusters that was a little bit uh, knocked loose, but well, not a serious problem? A little piece of insulation between a, an area that had come loose, but uh, you can handle small degradations in it. Where you'd worry is if you had a large area where there wasn't some sort of protection. Now, so right now they continue the, the switch throwing, and uh, give us a sense. We saw a couple moments ago some of those vehicles, uh, Bob, those uh, clearly doing what you just talked about, which is making sure that the gases are not an issue and so forth. Is it, uh, are they removing the gases from the immediate atmosphere around the shuttle? Is that accurate to describe it? No, the wind is going to move everything away. What they're making sure of is that it, uh, it's safe to approach close to it. And once they get a thumbs up, then the convoy commander will move his people in and they'll give clearance for the uh, crew uh, vehicle to move up to the side hatch. Uh, right now, they're uh, getting everything safe. They're safing all the reaction control jets, turning everything off so that uh, if there were a leak, it would be isolated. 
um, they're safing the side hatch so that the pyros that would blow the side hatch if you had to get out in an emergency have no chance of going off when they pull the uh, crew transfer vehicle up there. Um, everybody's getting out of their seats. They're trying to get their earth legs back, uh, move a little bit, and uh, start readapting to 1G. We taxpayers can be very pleased that the winds did not rise too greatly today because if the orbiter had to go over to Edwards Air Force Base, uh, it would have cost a million dollars to get it back here. <laughs> so we saved a million dollars today in gloves. Bob Cabana, let me tell you this, uh, we are uh, expecting to see that spectacular picture of everybody, you know, walking beneath the, the shuttle. I just want to go back to this point one more time because I don't want to belabor it, but nevertheless, uh, 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 Senator Glenn and several of the people who were involved in medical studies, they face a couple of weeks of uh, medical analysis. Do you sort of dread that in the back oh, of your mind? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's no fun being poked and prodded with needles and going in for blood draws every day, but... Uh, it's a small price to pay to be part of this program. I think that it's uh, incumbent upon all of us to participate and learn. That's what flying in space is all about. It's exploring and learning. Let's take a look at those two gentlemen walking beneath the uh, Discovery right there as it has completed its uh, 20th you give, you, give you a sense of the size of that beast, yeah. doesn't it? And what are, they're, they're obviously and, testing and they're for gases. Sniffing, right? right. They're out there with the sniffer smelling for uh, toxic gases and uh, making sure that it's safe. Now, the orbit itself is about 120 feet long, has a 78-foot wingspan, and uh, weighs about 200,000 pounds at landing. About the size of a DC-9, I'm told. R roughly. It's, it's roughly sure. the thing. I don't know if it handles quite like a DC-9. It, it actually, it handles a little better than a DC-9 and goes quite a bit faster. <laughs> you might say that. You know, a little going, higher. <laughs> a little higher, too. And that, that angle of uh, attack when it approaches the runway, uh, we, we talked about that, but you have to, let's try to relate that for people. It, it, when it comes down at a 20-degree pitch, the average airliner is coming in at no more than three degrees. So that gives you an idea. I mean, when the first time you did it, did you feel like you were coming uncomfortably close to the ground quickly? You uh, you feel like you're dropping out of the sky like a brick. Now, I haven't been an old A6 pilot. I did a lot of dive bombing runs, so I'm kind of used to diving at the ground like that. But I'll tell you, at night, yeah, the first time you do it at night and you're practicing for a, a night landing and that ground's coming up awful fast, there's a real tendency to start pulling out early. I bet, I bet. Well. The crew, ground crews continue their work, uh, checking for the outgassing, as they call it, and uh, very shortly we should be seeing that hatch open and we should see the crew of the, of the Discovery as they uh, disembark from what was a 3.6 million mile journey for John Glenn and the remainder of the Discovery 7.